Welcome to a Shot in the Arm podcast. I'm your host, Ben Plumley, and this is a podcast about global health and human rights. Thank you for joining us on this live stream quick take. We are at AIDS 2020 and HIV 2020 virtual. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, I'm getting very tired spending days in front of uh, computer screens, wandering the virtual halls quite aimlessly. Um, so our goal in these quick takes is to give you some short, pithy, to-the-point discussions with key leaders on issues that are either top of mind at these conferences or are not being discussed at all. And I'm absolutely honoured to be joined today by Christine Stegling, who is the Executive Director of Frontline AIDS. Christine, welcome. Thank you, Ben. Happy to be here. Well, I... It's it's sad that we're not here in person, um, but it's particularly sad for me because during your last visit to San Francisco, it rained constantly, heavily throughout your visit and for about a week <laughs> afterwards, and we desperately need that rain. So sort of double whammy for us over here. Yeah, and I never understood what sunny California was all about. Right, hey. <laughs> so... Uh, Frontline AIDS, can you tell our viewers and our listeners a bit about it, what it does? Yeah, Frontline AIDS is formerly known as the International HIV AIDS Alliance. Um, And for 25 years, 26 years now, we have been working as a global partnership um, to bring together really the biggest civil society network of community and civil society groups working on HIV. Um, And we really reset ourselves um, bit more than a year ago now to make it very clear with our new name that what we're really about is addressing AIDS and that was done in a at a time where we thought that the focus on AIDS was being lost. Um, We work through national partners and we're truly global partnership and we really believe in distributed leadership so we work through and with our partners um, rather than as an international NGO as as sometimes people might um, perceive us. Uh, which countries do you work uh, win and where uh, work in, and what uh, what countries do you have uh, partner distributed leadership offices in? We work in um, all over the world, uh, in Africa, in uh, North Africa. In we have um, we share our global office uh, between the UK, where I'm uh, situated, and Cape Town. Um, we have um, a, one uh, project office in Lebanon uh, for a grant that we're managing uh, with the Global Fund. Um, but we work everywhere in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, um, in Eastern Europe, uh, um, and um, really work with uh, national partners. So in every country, there will be a number of partners that work with um, the ship. And um, we did a huge exercise to really think about how do we strategize as that global partnership and we created a global action plan and the distributed leadership that I mentioned a second ago is really about how do different partners take um, responsibility for leading on the different actions. So we have 10 actions and every one of them is led and co-led by a partner in a different in different countries depending on people's ability um, expertise and, and interest actually to working on, on those issues. So for example, the first action is on prevention and that will be co-led by, um, by partners in, in um, for example, in uh, India and Ukraine, um, to, to give an example. Now, I, I confess I have a, a close association with Frontline AIDS through my board membership of AIDS Care China and uh, uh, mm-hmm. Frontline AIDS played a huge role in helping uh, AIDS Care China establish a harm reduction, drug harm reduction program in Yunnan on the, uh, the China-Myanmar borders. So you've, you've really helped community leadership move the needle dramatically in a, in a number of, of, uh, of areas, programmatic areas for key populations. And the beauty really, Ben, of the partnership, and that's what gets me most excited, is that it is really about learning from each other. And I I think that's our biggest strength, that um, 
you know, what works in China, um, the, the example, a good example is always the take home methadone uh, methodology that AIDS Care China developed. How can we carry that into a different country? Leadership skills that work in one country on bringing key populations to the table in um, CCMs for the Global Fund or um, for National AIDS Council conversations. What we learn in one country, how do we bring that into a different country? And I can see beautiful partnerships and, and exchanges developing between the different partners with or without our um, involvement as what is sitting in the center, what we now call um, Frontline Global. You were talking um, about how last year you saw uh, a decline in the commitment, both, I guess, politically and financially in the global AIDS response. And uh, that should have been one of the main topics we would be covering at AIDS in 2020 and HIV 2020 this year. But I'm really interested to know how COVID-19 has affected your work, particularly around mobilizing community leadership in this difficult time. Yeah, COVID-19 has really hit all of us, right, in every part of the world and, um, and particularly in communities and the poorer and the most more fragile and the more marginalized community, the harder this epidemic hits. So when people are talking about um, the epidemic being a, um, a leveler, I think that's obviously not true. It, it, um, it hits hardest where we already have inequalities and marginalization, and we saw that very quickly in our own partnership. Um, I have to be very honest, I've just come out of a webinar that we held today around adapting to this new um, pandemic and how amazingly many of our civil society and uh, have managed to adapt to bring things um, into virtual um, working, um, providing food, providing PPE, providing hand sanitizers, providing mobile services. So yes, communities have been hit hard. I think we haven't seen the worst of it, um, but I think communities have also been amazingly adaptable to the new situation. We immediately, I think in um, March and April, had um, bigger calls as the partnership and talked to each other. And, and that's when we realized how, how valuable this global partnership is because people um, were already uh, way ahead in their response to the epidemic. And, People in Senegal or Côte d'Ivoire could learn and, and adapt what um, people in Vietnam or in China, in fact, um, had done when the epidemic hit there. So um, we, we, have really, we have really seen an, an amazing adaptability by communities, but I think um, the long-term impact, the economic and the human rights impact that the lockdown in particular in many countries um, um, Will will cause. Um, we haven't seen the, the the end of that yet. No, and I I was in Cambodia just I guessed at the end of February, um, and and looking at a, a regional community AIDS response, uh, and just seeing in Phnom Penh the um, the absence of any street sellers of restaurants closed. You could just see wow, there is a there is an economic tsunami coming here. Um, one of the things that's come up in AIDS 2020, particularly in some of the satellites, has been concerns raised by uh, groups, particularly in, in Southeast Asia, that the, the shutdowns, the lockdowns, have afforded the opportunity to uh, security forces to start, um, uh, you know, start to, starting to get at uh, communities that are at risk, marginalized communities. And I don't know if that's something that you've seen in, in your work as well. Yeah, everywhere. And I think, you know, maybe to, to put it into a context or in a frame, how we have thought about re re responding to COVID-19, we've called it, we have a slogan or a framework for it. We call it sustain adapt and protect. And the sustain is about sustaining um, the HIV response. Adap response adapting is about adapting our what we do and protecting is protecting the human rights, especially of those most marginalized. And um, and we the protect really comes from the point where we have seen immediately that governments either under the guise of lockdown legislation or just because there is general chaos and, and everybody's locked in and that makes people um, who were already vulnerable, more vulnerable, that governments um, and, and um, 
and um, state agents have, have used that. So Uganda is a good example. Very quickly um, after the lockdown, um, many of people know about uh, that story. Um, um, a, a safe house that was supported by many of us of um, young LGBT rated 20 young people were arrested and it took weeks and, and lots of work from different partners to get them out, to even just get them, get access to them, to get them to court and eventually to get them out. And that really only happened because of the tenacity of, of HIPRAF and of SMUG and others that we support and others support that, um, that managed to get them out. And that had nothing to do with anything but really using the opportunity of, of the, the lockdown legislation. And there's more and more of that um, that we're seeing. You know, we have, a, we have a fund, the Rapid Response Fund, which you know, uh, you're well aware of, Ben. In, you know, this is a... a, a a, a fund for emergency responses for the LGBT community. Within weeks of, of COVID-19, the, the requests, these are quick, um, um, quick support, is quick support for individuals who are experiencing um, human rights violations or who are in danger. Um, it, the, the demand for that um, uh, fund went up by 300%. Uh, we have put, more, have put more resources into it, but we've also increased the geography and and recently actually increased the populations that can apply to it. So now we have opened it for sex work, the sex worker and the drug user community and are also uh, providing some support in that. So the, the 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 need is enormous, and you know why that is because people are experiencing these violations during this time. I'm very glad you brought up the uh, Rapid Response Fund and initiative. You're, you're doing that with the Elton John Foundation, right? That's a collaboration with them. Um, I, I think it's an initiative that many of our viewers and listeners uh, here in the Bay Area of the United States would be very, very interested in. There is a, I, I've seen a sort of a growing interest in expressing solidarity uh, with um, mm -hmm. uh, the LGBT community, but not just sex workers, uh, people who inject drugs, and how uh, now is the time for us to be supporting them as they as they face um, uh, some extraordinary challenges. Um, and I think there is an opportunity. While many of our politicians are looking inwards and America first, uh, I think there is a strong reaction against that. So um, I, I do think um, you know the Rapid Response Fund is a is a place where uh, people here might be interested to look at. And maybe what I'll do is send a, a note out from uh, the Shot in the Arm uh, uh, Twitter uh, and Facebook page to, to uh, <laughs> remind people about that. So looking That'll at the That'll be very nice. And, and just to... Oh. Yeah. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah, I was just going to say, Ben, so very much appreciated, obviously. And we, we really are trying to get more resources. And as you say, the... The initial fund was created with the Elton John AIDS Foundation, and we're always very grateful for their partnership and their support. Um, but at the time when COVID-19 hit, we did two we did two funds. One was this emergency fund, which speaks to the human rights violations and or responds to the human rights violations, and the other one was our partnership crisis fund. And we could have many, many more resources for that, which we don't have currently. But that organizations, because I think what we also need to understand is there's the there's the violation of individuals' human rights and the very precarious situations that find, people find themselves in. And then there's the organizational fragility that, that organizations are experiencing at a time, like you said, where people can no longer do three jobs in the informal sector because of lockdown, where services have stopped, where ART access has stopped, where methadone access has stopped. And we try to address those kinds of issues with the partnership fund. So. You know, like you say, I think we can all hope that all of us experiencing this epidemic at the same time, people in wealthy countries like the US, like the, the UK, um, feeling their own vulnerability that it will broaden global solidarity and people really trying to support others that are in, in need and, um, and, and, and show that solidarity by, by providing resources. And I think all you hear at the conference, I was in a meeting this morning with women rights organizations, all you hear is resources are very, very, uh, are very um, low in, at the community level and people are really struggling. Yeah. Um, I mean, 
you know, the, the opportunity here is to uh, shine a light on the uh, uh, the need for solidarity when, you know, here we are in the Bay Area, here we are in the United States, extremely vulnerable. Um, you know, news today that uh, new infections have, you know, reached three million. Extraordinary. And you certainly see the fragility across the Bay in, in Oakland and in um, the, uh, the, the next quick take that we're going to do, we're going to go to an, an organization that you visited, actually, CalPEP, to see how they're coping. Wonderful. And it, it's not been straightforward and easy at all, at all. I, I want to come back to resources in a minute. But, but first of all, you, you, you talked mm -hmm. about the session that you've just been in. What's coming out of AIDS 2020 that you're finding interesting that you think we should all know about? Mm. I think what's coming out is that um, I think there is a growing conversation and it's, it's in some ways led by, by um, UNAIDS and I'm really glad that it is um, for a new tone for saying um, the new ED, Winnie uh, Bianima, are very clearly saying we know what works, we have the technology in many cases, but we need a different political narrative and we need to use this opportunity when we see that the systems that we have relied on are not working that we need to shake them up and we need to create new systems and that's about you know equi equitable access to healthcare equitable access to medicines um but also you know talking about economic justice and we know those are the structural issues that we have all talked about for many years that are driving both the hiv epidemic but also COVID 19 and we don't talk about those, right? We keep on talking about a new tool, a new drug, a new whatever, but we know that what makes people vulnerable is that they're criminalized, that they're marginalized, that there is racism, there's structured racism that puts people at risk. We saw a brilliant plenary yesterday by Umfar on, on that. Um, we, you know, I, I thought it was the best plenary session I've seen so far at the conference. Um, we know about those issues, but they don't get the the, the, the the airtime that they deserve and they don't get the resources that they deserve. We keep on talking about the underlying structural factors that make people more vulnerable, but there's very little that um, that people are actually doing in that space. And I think UNAIDS, by adopting this new language around economic disparities and economic justice and using equality as a, a lens for looking at the HIV epidemic is a very um, good thing. And I think trying to um, really shape um, a political discourse that really talks about political leadership and a political accountability, th that will make the difference. And I ha I'd hope to hear more about that at the conference. I haven't heard that much about it, but like I said, I have heard um, a few very good statements um, from, from UNAIDS, which I think are, are good and uh, um, we heard this good plenary yesterday. Um, I so think I got to tell you, Christine. I I'm yeah. the the highlight for me in this conference, without a shadow, was Amfar's Greg Millet, and um, yeah. you, you know many of us were so worried that by going virtual, AIDS twenty twenty would would lose the the one opportunity that made this conference convincing, and that was to shine a light on the needs of the African-American community. But to see him so clearly demonstrate the disparities, I think, was just just electric. Um, and I, and you had, um, I forgot it. Sorry, no, go ahead. You had, um, you had um, a guest on your show, and I really enjoyed his interview. I forgot his name now, I'm Ace really Robinson. sorry. Um, also. Yes, beautiful um, interview. And, you know, it's that anger and that determination and, and bringing the facts to the table that what an unequitable society we live in and, and, and a society that is so driven by these structural injustices that we all have talked about for so long. And I think for me, that's kind of inspiring now. You know, this is the moment Black Lives Matter um, you know, the Me Too movement and the coronavirus in one pot allows us to shake this world and really talk about a different world that lives um, with different rules and that questions, you know, what we have accepted for so long. I mean, how many years have we spoken about um, gender inequality and how that drives the epidemic? But we haven't got the programs, the resources, the political will to address this. Now that we're talking about sexism in our own sector, 
racism in our own sector, in our programming, and the way that we do things, maybe, maybe there's a chance that we really can change something. And, and yeah, I have to say, I, I watched Greg yesterday, and yes, I was in a virtual space, but I was really inspired by him. Yeah. And, and so was I by your, by Ace in the, in the interview. I think it was yesterday or the day yeah. before yesterday. Yeah. So you, you mentioned Winnie, our new uh, executive director at UNAIDS, and these are exciting times for her. And for us, I think, for those of us looking for a rights-based uh, approach mm -hmm. to, um, to HIV. Um, and, and I haven't had a chance to talk to her or talk to the team. Um, there are just a, a couple of things I'd love to just get your thoughts on. Um, a sense that, now how shall I put this? And um, I can just see the UNAIDS leadership team throwing me the global report, throwing copies of the global report on top of me for saying this. But, you know, UNAIDS is about the joint UN response to AIDS. It's not about the joint UN response to mobilizing universal health access. And, and so how in this setting, in promoting these kind of long term but radical solutions to, um, uh, to ensure that people with HIV get the services that they need. How do we make sure that we can actually have concrete results there rather than trying to promote these huge structural changes that are going to, that are really well beyond the remit of, a, of, of an agency focused on HIV? Yeah, it's a big question. I don't know if I have a five or a one minute answer to it, but my sense is we need to throw up these big questions, right? And it's, it is the joint program. And so all the agencies are sitting around that table when we come to UNAIDS and we come to the PCB. So the trick will be to set the framework for those big questions, but at the same time, keeping a laser sharp focus on why it is important for HIV. And I think so far, the ED, the UNAIDS executive director has done a good job. You know, she has rang the alarm bells loud and has said um, in the last couple of days, we are failing on all the 2020 targets. We are failing on HIV prevention. We are failing on all the targets and we're not going to fix that unless we're doing something fundamentally different. And, you know, I can only be grateful because that's been what we've been saying for the last two or three years. And yeah, we have gotten very little airtime for it. And, you know, it's shocking, Ben, you know, this is the AIDS conference. There hasn't been any uptake from anybody. UNAIDS issued their, their report. I, I just checked uh, today with our communications colleagues to say, where has it been? Like, who has really run that story? 1.7 million people got infected last year, right? That's the same number of people that got infected the previous year. Almost 700,000 people died, right? And where's the outrage, right? And I and I do think, you know, we have an enormous um, opportunity right now with UNAIDS by creating the new strategy. I think, you know, under difficult circumstances, they're trying their best to try and get everybody's voice on board. I think some very difficult choices have to be made within the UN program, but also within us in, in civil society. We have to regroup, we have to reorganize, and we have to really mobilize behind a couple of things that are really important for the HIV response. I and and maybe this, this is the moment. completely agree with you. And um, we have to, we all have to rally around UNAIDS and really support this. Um, you know, those prevention figures, um, there's basically no change in the number of new infections for the last decade. We're still and, and, hovering around the same rate. This is an absolute and failure. And 60% and of new infections in key populations and their sexual partners. So what does that tell you about human rights and equity and marginalization? Those are so the big issues issues need to be addressed and it is not good enough for governments. You know, I'm part of the prevention, the global prevention coalition, and I still believe it's a good platform to change things, but it can only change if we really create a different political narrative when it's not good enough for you to come and say, actually, we don't know what the population size of the trans communities in our country or of the MSM community. If Facebook can figure out how many MSM are in a country, surely Got, you know, we can figure that out between communities and the government and really to hold people accountable and say it's not OK in the year 2020 to still say we don't know and we don't know what interventions to use. There's guidance, you know, for everybody. We know what we need to do. We just need to do it. And I think the big fear now for all of us will be 
that resources will go somewhere else. And I can partly understand that if I was in the Ministry of Finance right now in a country, where will I put my resources? I will put them on COVID-19 because that's the most pressing issue, right? And it is not about reallocating health resources, right? It's a looking across um, our resources and really making the right choices about where we need to put our money. And I think that is what's going to be the big, uh, big struggle. And we haven't seen the first of that. And I think I, I would have loved more of that conversation at the conference about where is the money going to come from? Because the global recession is going to hit us next year, not now. We're just right, starting right. to see some of that. Just in countries. We, just before we move on to resources. Um, Sorry, and I got by the way, away. everyone, this is what you're <laughs> seeing when Christine and I are sitting uh, uh, in uh, hotel bars at the end of long days of uh, workshops and advocacy and pressing and conniving and, and, and even pressuring people to do things. What's just missing is a glass of red wine. Um, Absolutely. But, but um, <laughs> there was one presentation right at the start of the conference. You mentioned Facebook, but actually it was a collaboration with Hornet, the LGBT Foundation and mm -hmm. UNAIDS, looking at their population of, uh, of MSM users around the world uh, and how COVID-19 was influencing them. And I thought that was a really important piece of work. But I would mm -hmm. love to get your thoughts on what's happening with funding in the in the light of COVID-19. Now, here is an international nonprofit NGO, the um, Frontline AIDS. How are you doing? How are you uh, uh, how are you able to convince your funders of the need for sustained investment in community mobilization? It's hard. And and, you know, we hear more and more. I mean, you know, I'm sitting in the UK, right? Um, this government has just decided to give up on a specialized development agency and fold it under the foreign office. And we're not entirely clear what's going to happen to um, to development aid in this country and development work and what's going to drive it and what, what the priorities will be. So we can see the signs and we can see the signs, you know, donors and, you know, government donors uh, telling us, you know, we're expecting a huge decline in our, um, uh, in our GDP next year. And, you know, development aid for those donors is, is counted as a percentage of their GDP. Um, um, and when it's in a good case, a 0.7 of that, a 0.7 of a reduced economy is going to be less money. And, and much more, I think, many more um, demands on, on governments also to use funding in their own countries because they have been hard hit um, by the epidemic. And I think on top of that, remember all these years of, of um, pushing an agenda of domestic financing in especially middle income countries, which we were always... Uh, we were always alert to because we thought, which you know, how many countries will really fund programs for key populations, for example? But those countries, those those uh, resources will be diminished, and we know that already. And probably a lot more countries will come down from their middle income uh, and low um, high income middle income country status. So I think it's going to be complicated, and that's why I think we need to have a a conversation about where are additional resources. So. That needs to be a proper conversation. And B, like I, I, I mentioned, I think we need to also have a conversation amongst ourselves as civil society and as community groups about how do we reorganize and how do we agree on an agenda that really speaks to two or three really objectives rather than dive, you know, going in all directions um, when, you know, when when um, that will not play to our advantage because people will turn away from us, especially at a time when HIV is falling off the agenda. And I think the the lack of real outrage this week around the new report and people saying it is unacceptable that almost 2 million people got infected with HIV last year is an indication that it's not very, very top. -up. No, we picked a really, in a sense, a really bad time to have an international AIDS conference, didn't we? But what, what were we to do? Mm -hmm. Look, there was one other thing that I wanted to ask you about uh, about frontline aids. You're based, we joke, in the People's Republic of Brighton, um, which is England's <laughs> San Francisco on the south coast. But you are co-located in the United Kingdom and originally founded there. 
what effect has Brexit had on you? Um, and what is this going to mean for frontline aides? Yeah, so we've been hit by all sorts of things, right? First, it was Brexit um, and and um, not real surety about what's going to happen about that and what that means for organizations that, especially international organizations that are running from here. And I would be lying if I said I was if I was any clearer um, about that. Um, and then it was COVID, and um, and so I think you know it it feels like a very fragile place right now to to sit in. As you say, we are co-located. We're here and in Cape Town in terms of our global team. Um, I yeah, it, it is something that we assess a lot. We talk a lot about in terms of what does that mean for our location. Is this the right location in the future for? Now it is, and and grown here. We have an international staff here, and we are we are. I think we are okay, but you know there are realities that we all have to to face up to, and one of them is obviously, um, you know, do we get money from resources from the UK government? Will we access funding from our European um, donors? And so we take that into consideration. But to be frank with you, I think it's too early to tell what the real impact is, and as you know. You know, being European myself and not British, as you might, people might have heard from my accent, um, you know, many of us who will live and work here, um, you know, we're quite unsure about our personal circumstances um, in those in, in this situation. Yes, I mean, I, you, you, you know, in the sort of the, the the classic interview situation, I suppose I'm not allowed to let my own personal views shine through. But, you know, Christine, I'm European, first and foremost. And, um, <laughs> I might be living in California, but I'm a European and, um, you know, actively part of the rejoin movement that uh, I, 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 I passionately, passionately believe in. But look, we're coming up to the end of the time. I'm really interested to know how you, a mum of two kids, running an international organisation, how are you stay, stay, staying sane throughout all of this? What's your secret source as you are sheltering in place? Uh, I don't know if you want to hear the true answer of this. I think to this, I think, you know, we have to be very honest and I think we don't, don't talk enough about We have all been here, all moms, we're dads, we're people with lots of personal circumstances and we're all working in a situation that we we haven't um we have never planned for right we have children at home we have care responsibilities um we have staff that are affected by COVID-19 and um you know it, it is a really tough environment and I think what's really tough at the moment is to figure out when it's it was an emergent that the, the first instance was it's an emergency we'll all pull together and we do all sorts of amazing things and I have to say I have an amazing team of people who do amazing things but as it goes on and as you think about the long-term consequences of this um I think it becomes a bit harder um on all of us um and and on uh, personally on me too and it is really about taking some time out once in a while and breathe and think about what's really important. I really enjoy part of what's happening at the moment is the opportunity to, to sit and reflect and really think about what's important. And that goes for our work too. And that's why I said, this is the opportunity where we could all sit and think, what do we really need to do to make a difference rather than um, getting lost in lots of very technical um, debates. And I think that what keeps, keeps me sane to think about the opportunity that might come out of all of this. Well, Christine Stegling, thank you so much for being on this Shot in the Arm podcast, Quick Take. Uh, a real shout out to you and your team around the world. And uh, when you get more engaged in your work around uh, re rebuilding or re-energizing uh, prevention, mobilization and prevention alliances, give us a shout. We'd love to be a part and support that. Well, and thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. OK, Thanks, everyone. Ben. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we will be back later in the day with an additional quick take. Um, stay safe, stay healthy, and of course, do not forget to wear your mask.